So uh, welcome again to another uh, wonderful Authors at Google Talk here in New York. Um, I'm really excited to have uh, Robert Zuckerman in uh, with us today. Um, let me just read a few, a few bits of, of things that, that people you probably recognize have, uh, have said about Robert. So uh, Will Smith calls him Picasso. Uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, Denzel Washington, Michael Bay vie to have him on their film sets. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the old governor. Uh, introduce him to President Bill Clinton by saying, this is Ro Robert Zuckerman, the best photographer I've ever worked with. You have to say, this is Robert Zuckerman. This is Robert Zuckerman, <laughs> the best photographer I've ever worked with. Get to the chapel. OK. Uh, so <laughs> uh, anyway, he's worked in, the, uh, as you can tell, he's worked in the motion picture industry. He's worked on. Uh, films like uh, The Crow, I Know What You Did Last Summer, Any Given Sunday, Training Day, Terminator 3, uh, Bad Boys 2, National Treasure, uh, and, and the list goes on, and he's also done television work as well. Um, the book that Robert is talking about today that uh, hopefully a lot of you were able to get is Kind Sight. Um, and it's basically a collection of photographs that accompany text um, that Robert really talks about the richness of, of everyday life, you know, the complexity uh, but also the simplicity. Um, it, it ranges from taxi drivers and bus drivers to waitresses, plumbers, uh, kids at the playground, um, and also uh, some people in Robert's family. So uh, without further ado, I'll let him get into the book uh, a little better than I can. Uh, so please put your hands together for Robert Zuckerman here at Google New York. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for the good weather, dude, too. Um, uh, just, well, I just thought I'd just start off by, um, I know that some of you have come from very far, like even maybe the next floor down to get here. But um, as far as the Terminator thing, I just thought I would just to really show you that I actually did work on that. Hold on one sec. I just, I'll just uh, cue this picture up here. This was on the set of uh, <laughs> Terminator 3. One day, one day um, Arnold's assistant, a guy named Dieter, who is also a German bodybuilder, fa fancy that, said, Robert, there's no pictures of you and Arnold. And he grabbed my camera and made me stand in there. And I was uh, trying to puff my arm out. And I realized that uh, it wasn't doing any good. But I really felt there's something wrong with this, uh, with this photo. So um, I just uh, decided that. <laughs> so, anyway, that's the actual photo. The other is a doctored one. Anyway, um, OK. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And um, Kindsight is a, a really a labor of love. And this, uh, the title is, is pretty self-explanatory, Kindsight, um, seeing the world with kind eyes, with kind vision. And there's been a lot of uh, writings and talk for you know, eons about uh, how you see the world is what it becomes. If you see the world with kind eyes, the glass being half empty or half full, um, it's a matter of choice. And I just. Uh, I've been in the uh, uh, a motion picture still photographer for going on 20 years and worked on a lot of big, violent action films. And I've always sort of had a personal issue with you know, all the violence that's in the media. And then especially after 9-11 happened, I, just, I, I, I felt that I wanted to say something that it wasn't really all about terror and about negativity. And um, for years, when I've been on the movie sets, I've always been fascinated by, what's, by turning around from the movie set and seeing what's going on around it. There's the people in the neighborhoods, the humanity. And uh, so I was on a, um, a film or project up in Las Vegas uh, in 2002. And um, uh, I became friendly with one of the extras, who's this old uh, gambler and his wife. And I um, ended up writing a, a story about them, uh, putting an image and text together. And I sent it around in an email. And I got a very positive response. And um, I just felt that there was uh, richness in everyday life to be, to be had, to be recognized. So I started uh, sending these emails around. Um, the first one was uh, Renee and Joseph White, which is, if you have the book, it's page 18. They're, the book is in chronological order. Um, and it's just uh, a picture of them with a little story. And uh, I began doing these stories, you know, few and far between. But then they started going out, and I got such a tremendous response um, that I would then uh, Occasionally, email around to all my friends some movie poster that I did, and people would, uh, a couple of people responded, Well, we like the movie poster, but we like the stories much better. And it echoed uh, 
something that I had heard many years ago in the early 90s. Um, I had also been a volunteer at an AIDS hospice out in uh, Van Nuys, California. And there was a big, I became part of a big citywide exhibition of art by and about people with HIV. Uh, and there was another artist who participated in the show uh, who was a HIV positive and albino. And in her artist statement, she said, uh, the more personal my expression, the more universal its meaning. And this really was like a bellwether. It really hit home to me in terms of my own work as an artist. It's what I wanted to, to show. And, and you know, as, as someone who went to a lot of movies, I always uh, tuned in more to the more personal films, like Mike Lee's my Life is Sweet, or films that really came from the heart. I found it to be more, much more resonant. Um, also, in the... Uh, in the mid-90s, uh, my mom, who uh, I have a, two disabled sisters, and my mom, single mom, was taking care of them. And she um, got into, you know, over her head with credit cards, as a, as a very kind of typical American scenario uh, people do. And um, she was considering filing for bankruptcy. And I decided I would, you know, before doing that, I tried to uh, go around and talk to some of the creditors and make deals with them. Uh, you, you're, you can talk to some of these credit companies and... You can like negotiate 50 cents on the dollar to pay off the debt and resolve it. But a lot of these creditors, you know, I'm sure if anyone who's dealt with the creditors, they're, they're pretty nasty. They're not very nice people. And um, I was one day talking to one creditor trying to arrange a deal. And she started out very nasty. And then I, I started to tell her about my mom and how she's a caregiver for a, my sister in a wheelchair who's got an unknown degenerative condition. And she goes, oh, my God, my dad uh, has MS and he's in a wheelchair. And then we ended up talking for like 45 minutes about, uh, you know, about our families, respectively. And it just went to that personal level, and it kind of broke through. And I really found that if you uh, talk to people on a, on a human level and just acknowledge them, then, uh, then it just, um, you know, that's, it's a great thing, really. And, it's a, and, I, and to me, that's, uh, it became to me something that I thought, well, life, you know, there's richness in everyday life. So that's, that's... Um, you know, that's how this, this started. And then I would just be going along, like the next uh, story, the one on page 20, um, is this guy, Will, Willie Harris, William Harris. I was just coming out of an art store uh, called Aaron Brothers in Los Angeles one day, and he was standing out there, you know, collecting money. And um, I stopped and talked to him, and he was, of course, a little bit liquored up, but he knew basically everything there was to know about horse racing. And he started to tell me about all these famous horse races, Seattle Slough, and uh, you know, from and I happened to have a still camera. I had a little video camera, and I made a video of him, and I gave him a few dollars, and made this photo, and then I did a little excerpt from uh, from his from his uh, you know his dialogue with me, and that started and it just you know just kept going on and on. Um, uh, then I think it was what in about the fall of two thousand four. Um, I had known James. James is, by the way, is the publisher of this book, James Crump. And uh, James um, had a company in Santa Fe, New Mexico, called Arena Editions, which is a really uh, very highly acclaimed coffee table book, beautiful art book company, and produced many books by uh, Peter Beard and um, uh, what's the guy's name, David LaChapelle, and a whole host of others. I'm going to introduce James in a minute. But um, James and I, I don't know how we met, but we had met years before. And had just kind of been in touch. And then I had lost touch with James. I think he went underground for a couple of years. And, I, and he surfaced in New York um, in you know, the summer, late summer of 2004. And I had had a bunch of these. Before this book even um, you know, was a book like this, and, and I hadn't even thought of the title, I just had a bunch of these pieces in a, in a binder. And they kind of all looked in the, in the email format uh, like, hold on, sorry. Um, you know, like you see them here, which is, uh, you know, there'd be a picture and then the text beneath it, and I'd send it around like that. So I had a bunch of these in a, in a binder, and I brought them in and showed them to James, and he really connected with it. I had, sent, I had shopped it around to maybe a dozen other publishers, and, you know, it's like uh, if it doesn't fit into the format that you like or it isn't some big slick celebrity book with people jumping in the pools naked or something, um, you know, they, didn't, they weren't really interested in it. But... Um, I think the whole thing about personal expression, I happened to catch James at the right time in his life, and, uh, and we were able to put this book together. And even though it, um, it was a rather small 
a uh, number of publications. It made a great impression on people. I got a lot of great feedback. Um, it went on, you know, went into Barnes and Noble, and I was, you know, I kind of hustled around and did a lot of book signings, got on some local TV and radio, and um, Columbia University. And uh, I've just found that it's been a great experience because it's become not just um, a book, but it's a real lifestyle. And uh, most of the people that I've met in this book uh, through just random encounters have become friends of mine. And I've you know, stayed friends with these people for three or four years now, even though it may, might not be all the time. Like some, um, some people like this, this guy, uh, oh. Okay, well, this is, I'm going to read this one story here because this is a really good story. Um, even though it's not maybe the, the, the most dynamic of the photos, um, this guy's name is Frank. And if you have, turn in your prayer books here to page uh, 132. Um, I'm just going to read this if that's okay. Uh, Frank, Los Angeles, September 2004. I'd wanted to upgrade my laptop's RAM from f the 512 it came with, which was, that was a going thing back then, uh, to one gigabyte. I saw this computer repair place in the mini mall and went in. Frank looked up my model number. No problem, my friend. We'll order another 512 and bring you up to one gig. In two days, he called to say the memory was in. I brought my laptop. He took it in back and came out five minutes later. Here you go. He turned on my computer to show me, but instead of one gig, it, was, it said 768 megabytes. What happened, I asked. Your 512 was made up of two 256s, and so this was the most it goes. I paid and left, but then felt, hey, wait a minute. So I went back. What do you want me to do, he asked. If I take out the new RAM, there's a 20% restock fee. But you looked up my computer beforehand. You should have told me first, I said. We went back and forth. It escalated. That's not how I do business, I said. Take me to court, he yelled. We stood there yelling at each other. So I took my computer and left, feeling bad. That night, I called a store and left a message. I don't like the way you dealt with me. You didn't take the high road. But I also don't like that I yelled at you. I'm sorry for that. I think you are a good man who is having a bad day. Please accept my apology. The next day, I got a message from Frank, almost in tears. You should not apologize to me. I should be apologizing to you. You are right. I did not take the high road. From now on, when you come into my store, you will be more than a customer. You will be my friend, and you will get $50 off anything you do here. I went in yesterday to say hello. This was a few months later. I saved your message, he said. I learned such a lesson from this. I wish I had learned this 20 years ago. Um, so I'm, this was in 2004. Uh, to this day, he says he still has the message saved on his thing, and he, he plays it for his kids, and they laugh at him, but he's, he's like a changed man. And it was just because of that one good experience. We're, we're friends. He comes to my uh, gallery openings in Los Angeles. And I do stop in his store, and, uh, and we hang out and talk. Um, so it's, that's one thing about Kindsight, is just um, that I had the option then of you know, a normal situation where I could be pissed off at this guy and never go back there. But I decided to kind of let go. and. Um, which reminds me of another uh, quote from uh, Lao Tzu. Does anyone here know Lao Tzu? Chinese philosopher, old, I don't know, BC, many years BC. Um, and uh, I don't know the Chinese. You guys probably know the Chinese, but I know the English, uh, which he says, in, the, in, follow, in uh, the pursuit of knowledge, every day something is added. In following the Tao, which is the T-A-O, which is the considered the way, the flow of life. In following the Tao, every day something is let go. So I think this was a situation of adding something and also letting go. Um, another favorite is uh, EJ, page 92. Let me find EJ here for you guys. Uh, there you go, EJ, EJ. OK. Um, I'm a middle-aged guy, so I have some, you know, I had to go in for a urology exam. So this was EJ, Los Angeles, June of 2004. Guys, if you ever want to quickly get past any hang-ups you may have about your genitalia, I strongly recommend going for a urological exam. 
I'd had a colonoscopy a couple of years back, but for that, they put you to sleep. You wake up and it's done. Here, I walk into a room and I'm told, take everything off and put this gown on. I'll be back in a few minutes. EJ comes back in and instructs me as to positioning on the table and stirrups. Okay, we're gonna insert a tube in your penis and another one in your rectum. You may feel a little pressure and discomfort at first. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I go through a momentary mental debate as to whether I prefer this very pleasant looking female nurse technician or some dude in scrubs named Bruno. But I don't have time to play out this scenario as EJ and her associates get to work. While casual and friendly, it is entirely non-sexual and very professional. I don't have to think about baseball or grandma or anything like that. Uh, in truth, years of caregiving for my now quadriplegic sister, Patty, have given me a better perspective of the human body. This is something shared by legions of medical professionals, healers, and caregivers around the world, including parents with infants and children with elderly, infirm parents. When you are caring for someone, a body part is a body part and not something evil or shameful. My sister, my friends, and relatives in hospitals helped me to learn this. So did EJ, but I can say now I'm glad it was her and not Bruno. <laughs> anyway, but that's, you know, it's also about just um, kind of getting past all these hang-ups and things. Uh, let me see if I have any other good ones. Um, okay, another one that I like was um, an early one. There's a guy named Larry Avents, which is page 28. Here we go. This was during um, when I was in Washington, D.C. in uh, the fall of 2003. I was working on a movie called National Treasure. And uh, I was out one, walking one night. So this is Washington, D.C., October 2003. Walking up M Street on this chilly autumn night, I smell Larry's liquor breath half a block away. Hey man, you got a cell phone I can use? I need to call my sister, go get some warm clothes. It's getting cold out here. I dial a number for him, they talk. He puts me on to say hello. After we walk together, he tries to set me up with his sister. She's light-skinned, you know. I ask him how he got to the streets. I had a job. I was a steward for seven years at the Capitol Hill Hyatt, but they only gave a 25 cent raise each year. A man has his pride. He tells me other things about his GED diploma, about having cataracts at age five. Then it's time to go. He looks me in the eye. Thank you, bro, you helped me out. You know, the Bible says people are the salt of the earth. Know what that means? It's like with food, man. People give the earth flavor. <laughs> so, you know, that was just walking up the street one night. I'm, I never saw him again, but you know, it's it just by paying attention and just by stopping and being open, I have a rich story of life, and it's, uh, that's what this book has been about. Um, hold on one second. I'm trying to find one that's from New York. No, it's not on the, I don't have it on the screen. How many people have books? Well, I'll, re I'll read it anyway, because it's a pretty cool story. It's on page 124. And I was just uh, heading down to the subway one day. This is uh, Miguel. Uh, New York City, September 10th, 2004. In fact, this was the day that I came to your office and we decided we we're gonna do the book. Um, descending to the southbound A train at 175th, I paused to photograph this plant growing through concrete and metal. Anyway, I'll just show, for, you can't really see it, but it's, um, there's, a, there's a plant growing through the stairs at, on the subway and this guy sitting next to it. Um, Miguel, also heading down, holds me up to snap, to let me snap. As I say what I'm doing, he drops down a few steps and says, hey, why don't you try it from down here? I take pictures too. I try his angle, but ultimately prefer mine. Two strangers, we instantly fall into deep conversation about everything. He tells me about a welfare mother he met and gave food money to and about someone else he helped out also, about the necklace he wears in memory of his brother who passed away last Christmas time about lying on his back in Chicago to get the most dramatic photo of the Sears Tower, about photographing the Twin Towers collapsing from his place in Brooklyn and how he would never sell the photographs, how in fact he wishes he didn't have them, about two out-of-body experiences had, he had, one while swimming in Mexico, almost drowning. Man, you're a spirit, really spiritual guy, I can tell. I feel like 
I can talk to you about anything, he says. People ask me my nationality. I tell them United Nations. My stop is coming up, but there's no end in sight to the conversation. While shaking hands, he says, I'm Taurus, an earth sign, so I can really relate to your picture of the plant. Whenever I see a plant coming through concrete, I'll always think of you. Me to you, my friend, me to you. We've stayed in touch as well, Miguel. I've uh, you know, talked to him on a couple other book signings. Um, let me see if there's any other good ones here. Well, anyway, the book came out in uh, late 2005, and um, I've gone, been able to go around to schools. Uh, I've done workshops with students where I've started programs in schools where the kids actually do the same thing. They kind of emulate this and write stories. And, uh, and what's, what's good about it is that some of the kids who are shy about writing uh, feel a little better when they can do it with the story. And I always emphasize, you know, you don't need to be grammatically perfect. Just speak your own voice. And don't worry so much about the grammar. And they really take to it. And the, and the, uh, and the uh, people like it a lot. I'm going to uh, pull up a couple others, more recent ones, because even since the book comes out, I continue to do these. And um, oh, I'd like to uh, make an official announcement here that there's going to be a second book. I've just made a deal with a publisher, so there's going to be Kind Sight 2 coming out later this year. So um, unfortunately, James has uh, moved on to become a, f a famous filmmaker now. Uh, but he's, he's been my spiritual backer, and uh, he's always been there. So he's going to be a big part of the second book as well. But here's a couple of pieces, um, uh, very recent pieces from New York um, that are pretty cool. I've gotten a lot of good feedback on this one. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, coming up the subway. I was still working on a film here. I just finished working on a film called Confessions of a Shopaholic, which is um, a Jerry Bruckheimer production. And it stars Isla Fisher, who's the uh, fiance of Borat in real life, and very comedic actress, who's just going to be a good film. But I was staying in, in Midtown, and I was coming up the subway at, um, on, a, on a Saturday night. I think it was a Saturday night or some late night. And uh, I ran into this guy, Deal. It's not in the book here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you. Um, riding up the escalator from the subway late on this Saturday night, I try climbing a few steps. And um, I've got a, some kind of unknown thing going on. So, but, I write, but the unknown condition that's weak in my legs makes it tough, so I just ride. Deal holds forth at the top, sing talking and moving around on one artificial leg and another leg with an abnormally protruding calf, both shod in timberlands. He has a cigarette in one hand and some crumpled single dollars in the other, which he extends toward me. I smell liquor on his breath as I approach. Can I help you, baby? It sounds, it sounds like it, he asks. No, thank you, I reply. Can I help you, I ask, handing him a $5 bill from my jacket pocket. He takes it, looks me in the eye, and hugs me. Thank you, my nigga. I'm homeless and cold. I need all the help I can get. What happened to you, I ask? Car accident, but I'm maintaining, you know? I drink some alcohol to keep my sanity on the streets, but I stay clean and take care of myself so I don't put people off. I can do backward somersaults, too. Though curious about this, I refrain from asking him for a demo, mindful of his slightly drunken state. Pointing to my cane and limp, I tell Deal I'm not sure where my walking situation is headed. Don't worry, baby. What you put out comes back to you. You'll be walking straight in a few years. Thank you is all I can say. Hey, he continues, I got a phone in case you ever want to hook me up with some work. I take down Deal's number and we shake grip hands. He walks back to his spot by the escalator and I head back to my hotel amidst people strolling, snatches of conversation, sounds, lights and smells of the city night with a powerful feeling in my chest that I cannot name. And um, I actually tried calling him. But uh, the cell phone number that he gave me, a uh, woman answered. And when I asked for his name, she like hung up on me. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not, I'll probably try again. Uh, and then this is going to lead me to Carmen. Um, Carmen, would you come up here, please? Carmen is in the audience, everybody. This is Carmen Velasco. Please give a hand. And uh, come on, come on over here. Um, Carmen, I was staying at the Essex House Hotel, which is kind of posh and part of the film crew. They put us up there. And Carmen uh, was part of the Bell team that helps you bring your bags to and from the car and upstairs and everything. And so we just, you know, normally you go into a hotel, and a lot of times you don't really talk to the people that help you out. They bring your bags up to your room, you give them a tip, and um, 
I'm going to read this piece about Carmen. Uh, Carmen, New York City, April 14th, 2008. Carmen is a bell person at the hotel where I stay while working on this, my current film job in New York. Early on in my stay, she expresses interest in what I'm doing and tells me she herself is an aspiring filmmaker who is in school and is working on a documentary project. I like that there is more than meets the eye, for usually a person in a brown hotel suit helps you get your bags to or from your room. You give them a tip, and that's the end of it. I see Carmen from time to time on my days at the hotel, and I invite her to stop by the location set of the filming to observe. Today, as Carmen helps me check out with my bags, I ask how she is. Fine, thank you, she says. I'm working. I'm going to school, working on my film, and taking care of my two children. How old are your children, I ask. My son is 19 and my daughter is 14, she replies. Well, soon they can take care of you, I say. Yes, but last November my son was hit by a car. He was in a coma for two months, broke both legs and other things. Now he is rehabilitating, but is in a, a very long process. What's his name? Mario. And your daughter? Kelly. I'm humbled and awed by the quiet strength of Carmen's character and spirit. So much on her shoulders, yet she is following her dream and all the while doing what she has to do in life. We make this picture on my way out, and I think about my mom and other single moms I know of and their profound strength and spirit. As I get in my car, she calls after me. Don't forget to Photoshop me. <laughs> oh, girls. So anyway, that's Carmen. And so um, do we have the microphone here for Carmen right there? Thank you. So um, what's your film about? Oh, it's a, um, it's a guy um, who provides uh, um, hot meals to a um, the late day laborers. So he stays in um, 73rd Street and Roosevelt Avenue. And he goes every night. To, with uh, hot meals to, for them is like he started with like thirty people, now he has like sixty guys. Wow! And that's what he does. So I uh, I was at the hospital and somebody mentioned that guy, so yeah. I had to do a project. So I went to the um, to the corner right there and yeah. I asked him if he speaks English and uh, um, to see if I can do the film. So wow. he says yes. So I did it, and it, it would come out good. So they nominate my um, my project for a um, festival. Really? Yeah. So. Oh, excellent. Wait, oh, you were at the hospital, you say? Was that with your son? or? Uh, yeah. That's when I heard about the guy at the hospital. Yeah. yeah. So you so you have been, you told me you've been working at the hotel. You work full time uh, for, 13, for like 13 years. Yeah, 13 years. Yeah. And you go to school? Yes. And you have your family and you're making yeah. films. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> wow. All right. Keep an eye on that. So, and um, I'd like to turn the microphone over to, for a bit to James Crump, who, uh, as I said, published my book, and I um, owe him a great debt. Thanks, Robert. Robert uh, obviously has a very infectious energy. It's a very, uh, it's something that it's, it's, it gets around. It's a good vibe. And um, while I had become aware of his photographs in Los Angeles, he was shooting uh, a number of movie uh, movie sets, basically, and I was introduced to his work. And we almost got close to making a book on, um, I think, the film called Training Day. Yeah. And um, I was one of those early recipients of the uh, emails he was sending around. It wasn't the type of work that I had really expected from Robert because I was so, you know, aware of the, what, what he was doing in Los Angeles and in the entertainment area. And um, I'd published over the last 15 years a lot of name brand photographers, sort of well-known estates, people like uh, Bruce Weber and. Peter Beard and uh, Peter Lindbergh, uh, states like Walker Evans and Gary Winogrand. And um, I looked at Robert's work in, in film really as sort of one of those, he's one of those individuals who took that, that genre of uh, the film still and turned it into an art form. And so when, when he started sending me these, uh, these things from out of the blue that he had been starting to collect, these stories, I just was, I was really blown away because I wasn't expecting it. And over the years he kept, you know, it was a couple of years that he was sending them around. And, um, one time he he lent me a, a a large parcel of them and I started looking at them and I I just was really struck by them I was really really moved emotionally and um, so we started this conversation about doing this work and and uh, while he can deliver the goods you know commercially and he has for years on the sets of of major motion pictures he's he's done something here which I think is really really unique and 
I think as a, um, a producer, as a filmmaker, writer, curator, I think it's the kind of project that deserves a really larger audience and to date it's received. It deserves the broadest you know, possible audience. It's a very worthy project that sort of hits the right note at the right time. And so that's why I'm here basically to support Robert because I think that the book holds up in every way and it's, it's something that, uh, as I say, his, it's infectious what he's doing and it, uh, it's sending out a, a different kind of message photographically and these stories are fantastic and uh, the pictures are wonderful and it worked really well as a, as a book. That's all I have to say. If there's any what questions. Do you, what, do you, what do you think about, um, uh, like, I just wanted, because, you, you know, there's a, a, some of the feedback I got early on was, you know, like the purists say, well, you can't have writing with photographs. I mean, Dwayne Michaels kind of scratched on his photographs and Allen Ginsberg did. But um, I kind of, uh, I, I, I never really bought into that. I felt that this was something that really worked together, you know, well. But I know that to some people, even some art galleries still, don't want to show these images because, uh, they feel oh, it's photos and photos and words together, and that's somehow not not pure photography or something. What do I think of it? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I, I think it's you know, I think it's challenging work. It's a new it's a new uh, commingling of texts. It's not the first time. Yeah. Obviously, you mentioned uh, Allen Ginsberg and Dwayne Michaels, very well known photographers who transcended that that gap and were able to show their work with text, handwritten text, by the yeah. way. I think that. Um, the more people become aware of Robert's work, the more they get interested in it, the more they're drawn in like I was, because it wasn't, as I said, uh, the type of work that I expected, nor was it really the type of work that I had normally published over the years as an editor or as a curator. And so it, I was just drawn in from a humanist perspective, from Robert's, uh, his energy and his sort of his spiritual mean that came across through the photographs and through the stories. And I think that it's just taking time, and Robert's been tenacious with sharing this work all over the place with schools and with groups like this. And I think that the more, you know, seasoned eyes spend with the work, the the probably the greater opportunity that will will be yeah. you know realized with this body of work. And it's not it's an ongoing body of work, which I think is interesting too, because it doesn't end with kind sight. The first book, it's going to continue going, and it, just just because he published the book. Unlike many photographers who would move on to another body of work, he, he keeps tenaciously moving forward through this series, and it's, it keeps getting better, keeps getting richer and, and more interesting. Well, it's like, yeah, um, I just want to go back, because there's, there's basically like a dozen quotes that I have that, you know, for me are the equivalent of a master's degree and a PhD, you know, and some, one of the great quotes that I say in my book is it's kind of a combination of two um, two quotes, uh, one by one person, and then this, the second one is by this guy, Brian Brown Walker, who uh, did, if you guys should check out, if, uh, if you're anyone familiar with the, a text called the I Ching, um, well, he does a version, this guy named Brian Brown Walker, that's the most accessible version. I mean, a lot of them are kind of very esoteric and hard to understand. This one's really great, but he, uh, someone else, I think it was Lao Tzu or someone else said, you know, if you, if you look for the good in people, you will find it there. And when you speak to the good in people, you strengthen it. So that's kind of another core uh, point behind, behind Kindsight. But one of the things I really like, and I'm glad I'm here at Google. I feel really honored to be here. But um, one of the initial ideas that I had was somehow to get someone like Google or someone involved, because I'd like there to be kind sites, S-I-T-E-S, all over the world where people are just doing this. It's not something that I feel like, I mean, I, I do this, and this is kind of my way of putting my good energy into the world, but a lot of people, you can do it through anything you do, and it doesn't necessarily have to be writing and photography. I mean, I got a story today about some guy, and I think he's been around YouTube for a while, about this guy in, in Texas who greets soldiers coming home from the airport, and he has like bunches of people like at the airport and hugging and greeting and thanking the soldiers, and it's just, you know, it kind of made my heart well up when I saw it. So you can be a short order cook or a doctor or something as long as you like, you know, you can instill kindness in, every, in, in your everyday life, holding a door for someone, uh, helping people with a package, letting someone in in traffic, just listening, you know, just listening to somebody, volunteering at a senior center, anything. It can be, I think it's just about putting positive energy into the world somehow. And uh, so I think with that, it's probably time to open the floor up to some, some questions. So I'll take any questions, comments, jokes. Anybody? Okay, thanks, goodbye. <laughs> I'll okay. kick it off. Um, so when, you, uh, when you're out and about and you, and you see yeah. someone uh, yeah. on the street or you have this interaction or whatever, do you know immediately that, uh, I mean, it, before you weren't really doing it for the book, but yeah. do you know like this is something that I want to 
uh, put into the next book? Do you, you immediately have that feeling or how do you, how do you go about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, it does. It, I kind of recognize it. Um, you know, uh, someone had once said that about these things that, you know, these stories see something in everything. And, and it could be that any moment or any encounter, any, and, it, and some of these things in here are not just encounters with people. Some of them are just random moments of observation, looking at clouds uh, or, um, you know, seeing, seeing something that evokes a feeling or an observation. So, yeah, anything can become a story, any moment. And that's the whole idea about the richness of everyday life. So, yes. Um, I like to sort of take photos while I'm out and about and yeah. often see an interesting situation with some people. Um, I'd like to just whip out my camera and take a shot of it. But I have, this, I have this affliction in that I'm British. And so it's kind of the whole idea of actually sort of going up to people and saying, hi, you know, can I take a photo, that kind of thing. It's kind of embarrassing for me. So, I mean, how do you deal with that? Do you just sort of take photos of people randomly and then just go up and say, was that okay? Do you sort of go up to them first? Like, how do you kind of break over that barrier that it's a bit weird to whip yeah. out this big camera and start kind of... Well, more, it's, uh, I, it's more the second thing. I don't, I don't, uh, I, I'd like to instill respect and keep a good thing in it. So I don't, I don't actually do the photo. I normally have a conversation and if, and if uh, at the end of the conversation I feel there's a story there, then I'll ask them their permission. And, I, and I, I've come to try and at least be mindful about how, you, how I even speak of it because I, you know, taking uh, this has been long, even in that, uh, for a long time, there's been an issue about the language of photography is very acquisitive and aggressive. Shoot a picture, take a picture. So I always say, can we make a photo together, usually? And when I go to the schools, I teach, I talk to the kids, I suggest that's how they talk, you know, because uh, it's two people collaborating. But if they don't want to, I just let it roll. I don't really force it. So, um, you know, I, I never, uh, like even when I was coming down here, I was going to, I was in a taxi cab and I thought, uh, I would just show you an example of how even just riding down here, there was, and I had this really interesting conversation with the taxi driver. And as I got out, I, it was raining and cold and windy, and I said, uh, I was standing outside, may I make a photo? And he didn't want to, and he kind of sped away. But, so, you, know, what could I, you know, what could I do? But, but that's, that's, you know, few and far between. But most of the time, you know, I think if you just uh, ask someone, and, and there's always, and to me, like I learned, especially on a movie set, because when I first started out as a film photographer, I wanted to get every setup, and then I realized I don't need every setup, and if I let go of one, something else would come along pretty soon. So um, that's, uh, I don't know if I can help you, but I think it's just a matter of, 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 of opening a conversation with somebody and letting them, and you know, it's, that's this type of photography. There's some other types of photography, like Gary Winogrand and other, some of the other great street photographers. They don't ask people, but they just kind of you know, grab it. And, uh, you know, that's an art too. And sometimes these little digital cameras like, uh, what do I have? Like, you know, always carry this. You know, I used to think I had to have a big camera, but now you can get great photos with these little guys here, you know, and they're a lot, lot less uh, sort of, you know, imposing. So that's also, I wanted to say my, 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 thing, my two basic uh, tools for doing this are, are, are a camera and I have a little notebook that I carry around with me and basically when I have an encounter like the one with Carmen, I'll take a moment to write down the little sort of morsels. I'll kind of freeze dry the, the encounter in, in a few words. And later I'll, I'll go home and I'll just add water, uh, the, like the water of care basically. And it comes back alive, you know, when I'm sitting typing out the story. So um, there's lots of stuff out there. You don't have to get everything. But, um, you know, I, I usually basically just ask people. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Hi, thanks so much for coming. Um, I thought I had just a comment, um, but then I thought of a question. So um, the comment is, I thought the, I, I wasn't in time for uh, for the book rush, but I flipped through a neighbor's and I thought the writing was excellent um, for the portrait of, uh, the self-portrait actually of you in the hospital. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, as for the question, the question is, um, what was your best experience to date on a movie set? Oh, uh, well, there's, a lot of them. Um, I think you know, overall, as a film, I, um, I really enjoyed working on Training Day, uh, even though it was a very tough movie. But uh, a lot, mostly on, in Hollywood, on a movie set, they're very conscious of the budget, and they only want you to expend fa frames and take photos of the focus on what's going on on the set. But on Training Day, because they were filming in a lot of the inner city, you know, tougher neighborhoods in Los Angeles, 
Um, they wanted to develop community relations, and they had this idea about documenting it. So they actually encouraged me to, to mix it up with the homies in the different neighborhoods. And so that actually was a lot of fun. I mean, I, it was a little daunting at times, but I went into some of the very sort of tough neighborhoods in South Central and, and East LA and um, you know, got, to, uh, got to really mix it up. And so that was, that was a lot of fun. That was a really good experience. Um, another one, I didn't actually work on the, on the, there's two different kinds of photography on a movie set. One is the day-to-day -day photography, which is what I do mostly. It's called a still photographer. But then there's, sometimes they do special photo sessions just for the poster, and that'll be, sometimes the set photographer does that, but sometimes they'll bring in an outside photographer uh, to do that. It's just like in more of a studio kind of photo shoot. And um, I was requested by Will Smith to do that special photography on um, Pursuit of Happiness. And I felt that was a really great movie to be associated with, and I was really proud. And you know, that was, that was something that was great for me. And also uh, was requested last year by Denzel Washington to, um, when he was directing The Great Debaters, which is another one of those, I think, very positive, worth, worthy films. And I was working on another film, but I actually was able to get away from that for one week and cover the first week of that movie. So those three, I would say, are, are something that I'm really proud of. And also The Crow, even though it was very tragic, um, it was still, I still felt it was a great honor to have known and worked with Brandon Lee in his, in his lifetime. And Ozzy. Yeah. And who? And Ozzy. Ozzy. Ozzy Davis. Oh, Ozzy Davis. Oh, my gosh, yes. I worked on a film in, um, in, uh, in 2005 in, uh, in, in Miami called Retirement, a very small film that just was now released straight to video. But Ozzy Davis, the venerable Ozzy Davis, who, uh, you know, not only a great actor, but a, just a great spokesman. And um, I was, he was in that film, and uh, he passed away in his sleep um, at the very early part of that movie. Uh, it was sort of like, you know, like, like maybe a third of the way through. And so I got to work with him and made a photograph of him with his grandson the, the afternoon before he passed away. And that was kind of very uh, meaningful to his family, his wife, Ruby Dee, and, and his daughters. So thank you for the reminder. And this is, um, may I introduce you? Yeah. Um, this is Malak Shabazz, who is the um, youngest daughter of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz, who I'm sure most of you have heard of them. And, and Malak is very active in um, keeping the legacy of her parents alive and, and also in many issues today. So thank you for being here. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi. Right, so I keep wanting to lean over this microphone. I realize it's right here. It's like you know. It's like, okay, I'm going to stay back here. Just browsing through uh, some of the the pictures and associated stories, I just yeah. realized that some of the all all of them are really personal and and profound in nature. I mean, how do you draw that out from people? Is just talking to them? Are you are you actively interviewing them, or is it just something that they're just just a listener of some sort? I think so. I when very early on in in uh, when I got into photography, even before I was doing it professionally, uh, I had been, um, when I, I got into photography a lot when I was a student at, at UC Berkeley in California, and I was living in the Bay Area there, and there was a lot of beautiful light and a lot of beautiful buildings, so my, one of my early, real early uh, fascinations was, was with the buildings and the graphics and the structures, urban landscapes, and uh, I had had a little exhibition in New York in uh, maybe 1978 of some of these photos. And while I was in New York, I was showing them around uh, to some of the larger, more prestigious galleries. And one of the curators looked at the work and he said, well, your work is visually stunning, but it, it lacks emotional content. And so that was kind of like, you know, something that was like a bell going off. And I, I sort of, uh, at that point, I decided I wanted to really be more open to what was happening. And I know, you know, some photographers and directors are more dictatorial or want to really control what's going on. I, really envisioned myself more as a receiver, as, a, as a, like a sponge, and just to receive what was there. And so that's kind of became my approach, is just to be open somehow. And I can't really explain the technique of how I do it, but it's just more of a thought process and an attitude that I have, is just to really be open and listen to people. And somehow I think people feel comfortable with that. And so when, I'm, when I have a camera with me, I just kind of try to be open to what's there and to be a receiver. I don't know if that oh, answers the question. Yeah, so it's OK. And to add on to your question, um, the, where my father was assassinated, the Audubon, we own it with Columbia in the city. It's now the Malcolm X Dr. Betty Shabazz Multicultural Educational Cultural Center. 
And it's it a 165th in Broadway, right? 3940 Broadway, 165th. Right across, yeah. it's the same place, right across from Columbia Presbyterian Emergency. Formerly it's called the, where, the Well, that famous Ballroom. picture yeah. of my father being escorted in. Uh, in any case, um, it, it was a long time to get this deal. And uh, we own it for, we have a 99 year lease, uh, 96 years left. But getting to, to develop programs uh, was very difficult, but we are on our way. However, in the beginning, before our papers are now at the Schomburg, uh, one of our board members is Robert's um, aunt, Janet Stoven. I work at the United Nations. I'm with UNIFEM Microeconomics for Women and Children in Third World Countries. She brought him in, and we really weren't sure how we were gonna try to document a lot of things, take pictures. I mean, it's a very sensitive topic. He came and he made us, <clears throat> excuse me, made us feel extremely comfortable to answer your question. It's his, his energy. Uh, and we're six daughters and we're not easy to get along with. And we did. He was one of the few neutral people that we all felt. I mean, this is what he does. So kind to two, three, four, I think everybody should get it. But he documented our papers, being my dad's papers at the Schomburg, and some different issues with the center now that we are, ultimately, I'm working on a documentary, I'm going to incorporate some of his work, and he's going to be working with us. But it's, it's energy that he just, you can be the most difficult person on the planet. There's six women. My, my, there's six right, of us. There's three and, right there. Oh, bad hair day. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, uh, that's only three of us. But um, it was, it's very, it's not, it's not been easy being the daughter of those two people. But we are strong women and he came, every time he's around us, we smile. You know, so it's really him who really just, whether it's on the street or in the center or with six daughters of those people, I'll be nice. Uh, it, it's just Robert. So it's, it's about his energy and how he approaches you from the person on the street to somebody in the White House that he can have you open up and just talk. And then you pose. We were frowning before that photo. Ozzy is my surrogate uncle, so to speak. That uh, Auntie Ruby, the whole family loves that. I mean, you can't just, that's his, his oldest grandson. Uh, people, that was the, off, the afternoon before he passed yeah, away. Yeah, uh, people just open up because of his energy and his honesty and with Hollywood and everything that's going on, when you finally find someone who's um, really genuinely honest and makes you feel comfortable and open up, it happens. Trust me, it happened with us. And anyway, 3940 Broadway and 165th Street. <laughs> Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a very great place. They have a touchscreen kiosk with a historical, you can go up there. Uh, uh, Columbia's uh, Digital Ventures Unit, we, it's, it's a, a living memorial museum. It's absolutely, excuse me? The, the name is the actual Okay. The Malcolm X Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial Education and Cultural Center. Okay. But our, we'll be live next week online. And it was, but in any case, uh, he was, we had very, a lot of people who tried and they were a little sketchy. They were out for themselves. He wasn't out for himself. He was out for bringing out the energy and the positivity, positivity and the philosophy of both of my parents and making it, and he just did a very good job. And we're, that part we're still working on. We're getting our website down, but um, there were a lot of people who just were out for himself. He wasn't out for anybody, but just bringing out what, my parents, where he was try wasn't trying to paraphrase or reinvent. What he did is what was. He captured exactly what, just like in these photos, and with Carmen, he captured, you know, he'd just sit down and talk to you, and he just captured uh, what we wanted to be. And all six of us are completely different. He only met three of us, but he captured all of that without uh, conflicting in our personalities. And we all wanted to take him out to lunch afterwards, trust me. You know, <laughs> he has three uh, uh, wedding proposals, but anyway. Oh. <laughs> yes. I'm back. Um, What's your name? Janet. Oh, hi, Janet. Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so... See, this could be a kind side story right here. I could photo make a photograph and we could have a little story. Oh, not today. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so uh, my first question is, or second rather, um, is if you weren't doing photography, what would you be doing? And then the second question is, um, that was... Oh, third, just kidding. Um, oh. That was just uh, inspired by that fabulous photo of um, Ozzy Davis and his oldest grandson, which I love, 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 um, is I was going to ask you, um, who do you think takes the most honest photograph of you? Mm -hmm. um, but now the question has sort of uh, changed into um, how how do you think the most honest photographs are taken? Because um, I don't recall where I read or heard this, but um, I it was some time ago that I heard um, the most honest photographs are of, of taking people's backs because they're not looking at you and trying to manipulate their image and, you know, for the camera, yeah. but it's when they're really vulnerable and you can catch their essence that way. Um, I don't know if that's why, one of the reasons why I love that last photo so much, but I mean, in your experience, how do you think the most honest photographs are taken of people? So. Um. That's a good question. I don't know if I know the answer, but I, I, I feel again it's the intention that one it's the intention that one goes into it with, and um, so you know it's it's basically uh, uh, Sam Wagstaff, who was uh, the subject of James's uh, film, um, was a great photography collector and curator of the last quarter of the 20th century, and he came and spoke when I was a, a college student. And one of the things he said is that there, there are no bad subjects, only bad photographers. And again, I, I think it's a lot has to do with the photographer and person. So um, all photography, I mean, you know, people say, oh, digital photography is a manipulation, but so is traditional, you know, older photography. Everything's a decision about where you're going to place the person, how you're going to crop it. You know, it's all a manipulation. It's just a different, different medium and different tool. So... Um, I really think it's just the intention, the intention behind it, and the mindfulness. And um, and uh, when I uh, I do a lot of uh, family portraits, and I also do a lot of in between when I'm work, not working on the movie sets. I do a lot of uh, headshots with actors, and um, I go into the session with the intention of wanting to help them out. You know, say this is going to be your photograph. I want. I really want it. I'm here for you. It's your time. And I think with that intention behind it, then something comes through from, from that. So it has, to, has a lot to do with the intention. Also, as far as photographs from the back, I mean, this one of uh, Ozzy and his grandson, Jihad, was, I think, very good. I, I also had the opportunity uh, back in 1995 to work with Gina, Gina Rollins. Have you ever heard of her? Great, great American actress. And she was someone who... Uh, could speak very softly and, and yet had a very powerful presence. I mean, she didn't have to yell. But I remember on the movie set a few times um, seeing her from behind, and I just had such feeling just seeing the back of her head. And I don't know what it was, but I, I have to say that I agree with your point that sometimes you can really feel a lot if you're open to it. And um, a lot of times uh, we see things or experience things because of preconceived notions about how we have. And, um, Another one of my favorite quotes is by, and I, I don't know if I'm getting the pronunciation of his name right, but there's a Vietnamese monk named Thich Nhat Hanh, and he's prolific, very written many, many books. But one of the things he says in a book, uh, he has a book out called Being Peace, and in it he says, uh, things, uh, in order for things to reveal themselves to us, we need to be ready to abandon our views about them. And that's also has influenced me in my photography, because uh, sometimes... Um, you know, you set out to look at one thing, but then something else will be in the way, and that and that uh, that that becomes. So it's just being open to the moment a lot of times. Uh, anybody else? Anybody have any stories they want to share? Is that it? Unfortunately, we are out of time. We want oh, okay. to have some time to for you to sign the book. So, sure, uh, Robert. Thank you very much. Oh, thank uh, you. I think we we've been honored that you're here. And everyone else that that came, James Carmen. Thank you. Um, so again, thank you very much, and, and we'll be doing the, uh, the signing right over Okay, there. can I just say one more? Yeah, no, yeah, sign one it up. One more off. thing, baby. No. <laughs> no, just about, uh, about the idea. I know, I know. Just, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if any of you people from the Google community, but uh, I, 
I want to keep myself open to any communication from anybody. And if any of you ever have any stories and you want to like try this out and send it to me, uh, or you know, start a website, or just kind of get these these stories out on Google around the world, you know, I'm really open to to that, and that's something I hope to do. So, I'll just say, open you know, notebook, camera, and uh, you know, come at me with some stories. If it's all right with you, I'll go ahead and just, uh, do you want me to send your email out to? Yeah, absolutely. And it's also in the back of the book, too. Great. So I'll send that out, too, uh, as a follow-up to the talk. OK, thanks. OK, thanks a lot. Thank you, guys.